Welcome to another episode of Exhale, a podcast series where we explore topics on spirometry and respiratory care. Your hosts are Mark Russell, Marketing and Communications Manager, and Jance Lanier, National Sales Manager and Respiratory Therapist for Vitalograph US, a global leader in respiratory diagnostics. We had an opportunity to speak with Dr. Dermot Ryan, an honorary research clinical fellow at the University of Edinburgh and chairman of the primary care interest group of the European Academy of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. We discuss primary care physicians in the United Kingdom and how they deal with asthma. Well, Dermot, welcome to our podcast. Thank you, Mark. Please give us a little background on yourself, education, experience, and your current responsibilities. Okay, my name is Dermot Ryan. I qualified in University College Dublin back in 1977 and did my primary care training in Ireland. And then I traveled around a little bit, eventually ending up in England in a partnership as a general practitioner in 1984. Uh, And I developed an interest in asthma around 1985, which has been one of the central things of my professional career, I guess, to date. So I've always been a general practitioner. I'm not an academic, just just a real life GP or primary care physician or a family physician. The name dependent changes from country to country. In the UK, GPs look after people from the minute they're born to the minute they die. So we, we look after children, adults and the elderly as well. Currently, I retired from general practice a couple of years ago, but I came back to work because of the COVID epidemic and mainly my work at the moment is in vaccination centers. Great, well, why don't you tell us about the Respiratory Effective Group and who makes up this group? Well, the Respiratory Effectiveness Group is a group set up by a bunch of interested clinicians who work around the world. It's a global not-for-profit organization. It's a collaboration of clinicians and scientists and epidemiologists working together to identify and fulfill real life research needs in respiratory medicine and advocating for change to drive improved patient management. So real life differs from the fantasy world, I use those words advisedly, of guidelines which are drawn from highly controlled clinical trials and the findings may not always be applicable in ordinary everyday practice. They do of course become the foundation of our guidelines and are a very, very important part of the evidence base. But then we need to translate the evidence base into the environment in which you work. And primary care patients are considerably different to those seen in secondary care, and very much different from those who are seen by clinicians in tertiary care, although we will have people from all of those groups within primary care. So for example, guidelines really meet the needs of people who fall in the middle. Uh, So if you look at it, bell-shaped population curve, they'd meet the needs of the people falling between 45 and 55% of the median. But the vast majority of people fall outside of that. So it's about trying to use the true meaning of evidence-based medicine using the guidelines to meet the needs of the individual patient using your clinical expertise and the resources available to you. As I said, there are people from around the world, from the States, from Canada, from Asia, from Europe, working together to try and achieve this. And we have done some very good stuff. We've we've identified a core data state for asthma and COPD studies, that's known as Torpedo. We looked at the management of asthma in childhood, uh, real life comparative studies to the addition of antibiotics, the management of asthma exacerbations in primary care, looking at point of care biomarkers in asthma management, which of course is quite important, particularly in the tertiary care environment and made a manifesto concerning the use of real life evidence in guidelines, which was published in the European Respiratory Journal uh, a couple of years ago. So I know that you're part of the International Primary Care Respiratory Group. Can you give me more information about that? Oh, with pleasure. The International Primary Care Respiratory Group was founded at the annual scientific meeting of the Primary Care Respiratory Society in Cambridge in 2000 and held its first international meeting in Amsterdam in, in 2002. It has a scientific meeting every two years and a research meeting in the years which you take those two years. It's made up of primary care respiratory interested groups from about 35 nations across the world, from from wealthy nations and from low and middle income countries as well. It reaches about 150,000 physicians and it shares its journal with the Primary Care Respiratory Society, the Primary Care Respiratory Medicine, which is published by NPJ. 
the NPJ was uh, the Primary Care of Spiritual Medicine was, was founded in particular to publish evidence generated within primary care because this is sort of an area which doesn't necessarily appear very often in, in, in specialist journals like the Blue Journal or the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology or the European Respiratory Journal or Thorax. But it was very, very important to have a showcase for the research done within primary care to meet the needs of those patients and doctors who work and who attend primary care. So what are their goals and how have they effectively improved patient care? Well, their goals are to improve patient care. This is the IPCRG. And there have been some very, very active programs in low and middle income countries to help improve care, particularly a program looking at reducing smoke, domestic smoke within the house. So in many countries in the world, fuels are used within the home, but for example, not used with a hole in the roof or a chimney, but even something as basic as a hole. So mothers and children are breathing in fumes the whole time and that impairs their respiratory function. So that started off in Uganda and has now been rolled out in other countries. We've also looked at ways of trying to improve respiratory function tests in low and middle countries, looking at sourcing less expensive uh, spirometries and even some simple things like peak flow meters. And also try to moderate guidelines as they currently stand to meet the needs of the population working in those countries, which some people might say is dumbing down, but on the other hand, it's better to have something on the ground which makes for a more accurate diagnosis and therefore more direct treatment than having no guidance or no idea of how to proceed at all. I agree 100 percent on that one, especially with making sure that we get almost every patient out there or potential patient out there seen. A lot of times in third world countries, you don't have the means to even do a basic assessment, but having a peak flow meter at least gives you a quick snapshot or a monitor of some sort to maybe exacerbate or move them on to, to doing spirometry slash full pulmonary function testing. Of course. And of course, we also recognize very, very clearly that the respiratory needs of the primary care physician vary enormously from country to country. Mm -hmm. So in the United Kingdom, we don't have much tuberculosis, for example. Sure. Um, but I would see in practice, I would have seen new, one new case a year. And that's an awful lot more than most GPs. But I lived in a, an area with, with a fairly high number of immigrants. And I was talking about this with some colleagues from Pakistan, and they said, we see two or three new cases of TB every day. So oh, wow. Far, yeah. So their needs are considerably different, and their, their viewpoint is, is skewed compared to ours because their needs are so very, very different. And, of course, community-acquired pneumonia is, is also very, very common uh, sure. in low- and middle-income countries, particularly amongst children, uh, and as a real killer disease. That's amazing. We, we don't see anything like that here. You know, a lot of healthcare workers do the annual TB testing and so forth, but seeing one a year is a lot in our eyes, but then seeing one or two a day, I can't even imagine just the risk associated with it as, alone. Moving on, what are some of the problems with diagnosis of asthma within primary care? Well, I think the biggest problem with making a diagnosis of asthma in primary care is the feeling that you have to make a diagnosis straight away, which of course is very definitely not the case. Diagnosis needs to be made over a period of time, maybe over three or four consultations. Sometimes it's obvious when a patient comes in that the diagnosis is asthma, but really the diagnosis needs to be considered a provisional diagnosis until you've proved it. Now, one of the problems with asthma is there is no complete picture of what somebody with asthma looks like. So if you think about a picture uh, and break it up into little pieces, like a jigsaw, then you have to put together those pieces of the jigsaw in order to try and get a fair idea of what the big picture is. Central to that is the need to demonstrate, in my opinion, either airway variability or reversibility. One of the big problems is that Oftentimes, tests are done on patients when they are asymptomatic or clinically stable. And in which case, unless you're doing provocation testing, the tests will be negative, giving a misleading reassurance that there's nothing going on here. So we need to look at the picture. We need to look at the actual symptoms the patient has at the time when they come to see you 
how long they've lasted, how they vary, what brings them on and so forth. We need to think about the family history and whether there's anything relevant in that. First degree relatives with asthma or a personal history of eczema, for example. We need to think about occupational factors. About 10% of people, adults, have occupational asthma. And some people have, it's akin to occupational asthma, hobby-induced asthma. So we need to think, what are they doing in their, in their personal life, which might be causing these symptoms? We need to be thinking about what medications they're taking in case they are causing a problem. We need to think about comorbidities which they may have, and in particular rhinitis, be it allergic or non-allergic rhinitis, because both impact upon asthma and make it more likely the patient has got asthma, but having rhinitis doesn't mean you're going to have asthma. And we need to think about what biomarkers are, are, are available to help us to put together the picture. So having a high eosinophil count is not, for example, a biomarker for asthma, but if you have a high eosinophil count in the presence of other features suggesting asthma, then it may very, very well be helpful. And we need to think also in terms of what is found on clinical examination. And one of the things which I find very distressing, and I have observed it very, very frequently, is that the number of times now a clinician examines a patient with their clothes on. So they're listening to the chest through a shirt or through a blouse, which means they're not really listening to the chest at all. They're pretending to do something. They're going through the motions. So the examination, which should include pulse rate, which should include respiratory rate, which should include examination of the chest, and if possible, at least a peak flow reading, needs to be done properly. And I think at the moment, many examinations are not done properly. We know that in primary care, spirometry is a problem. Successive studies from the United Kingdom and uh, the Netherlands have demonstrated that only about 30% of primary care clinics do spirometry to a decent standard, as opposed to 60 or 70% in the hospital setting. So even in hospitals, spirometry isn't always of a, of a high standard. And that can be very misleading, whether you talk about asthma or COPD. So it's not just about having the equipment, it's knowing how to use it, it's knowing how to do the test properly, and it's knowing how to interpret the test when it's done. Absolutely. You hit on a, a hot button at the very beginning of that portion, and you talked about always needing a diagnosis, first time meeting with a patient. Here in the States, somebody goes to the doctor because they're, they're sick, and they want to know why right now. That's just kind of the U.S. eccentric way of life. You, you need to know the answers right now. But as we know in our field, it can take weeks of testing just to verify something, right? Um, whether yes. it's oncology or whether it's with respiratory. That's why I feel like trending data is fantastic from a patient that is just recently diagnosed with asthma. You trend that data for the next 30, 60, 90 days, how they're doing with their inhaler and so forth. So it's one of those where kind of leads me to, you know, why is asthma overdiagnosed? That's huge. I think it's one of those big things that it's kind of, well, the markers check and I can't uncheck them. So I'm just going to go ahead and say you have asthma. In your mind, why do you think asthma is overdiagnosed? One of the big culprits is cough. So certainly we're seeing it in many practices in the United Kingdom. Somebody comes in with chronic cough and they are diagnosed as having asthma just because they have cough. No wheeze, no other symptoms, just cough. Now, of course, the gastroenterologists see this as well, patients with cough, and they put it down to reflux, and patients are given PPIs, and that doesn't particularly benefit them either. So cough is, in isolation, is rarely an indicator of asthma. Cough, however, in association with shortness of breath on exertion, or night cough, or night cough with wheezing, or cough with tight, tight chestiness, when you add those things into the mix, you increase the probability of the person having asthma. But again, that can't be confirmed unless you actually demonstrate airway variability or reversibility. Another big factor is dysfunctional breathing. So we've all probably suffered from dysfunctional breathing at some time. You're driving along a motorway and you might be a little bit above the speed limit, for example, and uh, you see some blue lights in your rear view mirror and your chest goes tight and you feel a bit short of breath. Well, that's not asthma, clearly. That's you're worried in case you're going to get a speeding fine or a speeding ticket. So there are times when we are all a bit provoked and we may feel a bit short of breath or a, a bit tight chested or feel our heart beating a bit more quickly. But this is due to a momentary anxiety. 
Similarly, there are many people working in jobs which cause them to speak rapidly, loudly, over a protracted period of time, maybe under time pressure, and they often feel short of breath. The big thing is, you ask them how, what did they mean when they feel short of breath? Is it difficult to getting the air in or getting the air out? And invariably they answer that the problem is breathing in. And that's partly because they hold themselves in, in a degree of hyper expansion because of their anxiety and they actually find it difficult to get air in, as would somebody in an acute severe asthma attack. But observing the patient in the consultation, looking at how they talk, looking at how they breathe during the consultation, observing their neck muscles and looking at their other behavior, these are all clues that can be employed to determine whether the patient has more likely got some form of dysfunctional breathing or whether there really this really is symptomatic of asthma. And of course, the problem is the two things can coexist, which, <laughs> which means, as always in medicine, nothing is 100%. And that's why you need to look at the whole jigsaw of what's going on rather than one single thing in isolation. So why are there so many poorly controlled people with asthma in primary care? Oh, well, that's a loaded that question. That, that is a, a very big question. And of course, it's not just primary care, it's people in secondary care practice and, and tertiary care practice as well. So if we look at tertiary care, a paper published by Liam Heaney in The Lancet, the early part of this century, Liam runs a tertiary clinic in Belfast. Two thirds of his referrals come from secondary care clinicians. Very few actually get in through directly through a primary care physician because it's a tertiary referral center. 30% of the patients referred to them don't have asthma. So they appear to have uncontrolled asthma, but actually they've got uncontrolled problems, which people mistake as being asthma, but they haven't got asthma. So again, this is where the overdiagnosis comes into place. Many people with uncontrolled asthma haven't got asthma. And of course, uh, there was a paper by Sean Aaron and his colleagues from uh, British Columbia in Canada reviewing people who'd had a diagnosis in the last few years and again found that about 30% of those didn't have asthma. Many of them had just simple rhinitis, but equally, many of them had no pathology at all. So overdiagnosis is very, very important. The second big thing, I think, is inhaler technique. So most doctors and most nurses, and there are a multitude of studies from across the globe which demonstrate this don't know how to use an inhaler. If they don't know how to use an inhaler properly, they can neither teach the patient how to use the inhaler, nor can they check the inhaler technique because they don't know the steps which are involved and point out where the fault is. But you know, when you have patients coming in, having seen another physician, and you ask them to show you how to use their inhaler, and they stick the inhaler in their mouth with the cap still on, you know you've got a fundamental problem. A further factor is that many patients are on a mixture of dry powder inhaler and metered dose inhaler. These are two different types of inhaler with fundamentally different inhaler techniques. And the patients have difficulty, as indeed healthcare professionals do, in recognizing which technique is for which device because they haven't been properly taught. And so they may be using their inhalers regularly, but getting little or no benefit from the use of that inhaler and certainly may not be getting anywhere near the intended dose for the patient. Now that in itself then means the patient finds that the medication doesn't work and they stop using the inhaler. So adherence is a problem, partly because they think it doesn't work, but there are other reasons behind faulty adherence, and that's a failure of the clinicians to educate the patients as the benefit of the treatment that they've been prescribed, and the importance of taking it every day or nearly every day. I mean, there are some people clearly with seasonal allergic asthma who only need to take their medication for maybe six weeks or three months during the course of a year and can have medication holidays at the times when the pollens which are causing their problems aren't around. But by and large, the patient needs to understand, needs to understand and feel that they, they should take their medication every day, if at all possible. So patient beliefs clearly enter into this as well. And beliefs are things which are sometimes can be found difficult to change. But with a careful, caring, rational explanation, you can win most patients around most of the time. So those are some of the reasons why patients remain uncontrolled.
Absolutely. We here at Vitagraph, we preach, you know, the educational side of aerosol inhalation monitoring, you know, so we have a, a product called the AIM, which basically trains the patient how to utilize either an MDI, DPI, or a spacer, and ensuring they're, they're accurately getting the proper medication that they need. So I've been all around the states preaching and, and teaching effective use because utilizing 50% of a medication isn't designed. You know, we, we want to make sure that those patients are getting everything that they need when they need it and quickly. Moving on over to primary care, referring those patients that you've diagnosed with asthma or any other respiratory lung disease or ailment, referring those over to specialty care. What, what is your process and how can we increase those referrals? There aren't really any guidelines or statements which tell when we need to refer. They all say, and quite rightly so, that if there's diagnostic doubt, the patient should be referred for a second opinion as to what's going on. And that's very, very clear. And that would be the same with any specialty because, you know, a GP doesn't know everything about everything. We'd like to think we do, but the reality is that we don't. Uh, so if you're unable to make a diagnosis, there's no shame in asking a specialist for help in getting to make that diagnosis. What we see is with patients with them um, being uncontrolled, judged by either a continuation of symptoms, having symptoms. So somebody has symptoms most days of the week or using their reliever inhaler most days of the week or patients who are waking at night or whose social life is impaired because of their respiratory symptoms. One of the things we do or tend to do is to escalate the dose of their medication. So we give more and more medication without checking, first of all, that the diagnosis is correct. And we're not going to get it right all the time. But checking the diagnosis is correct is very important because, you know, inhaled corticosteroids don't really work for dysfunctional breathing. Check the diagnosis is correct. Check the inhalation technique is correct. People say this takes time and it does take a bit of time. But actually, it also gives quite a bit of amusement to the day because some of the things that people do with their inhalers is just phenomenal. I mean, from spraying your medication onto your sandwiches to take to work so you get your afternoon dose to putting the whole inhaler in your mouth and trying to actuate it. It's worth watching people do it because there's often so much to correct. And it'll give you a great batch of stories to tell when you're talking to other people about inhaler technique. So inhaler technique is absolutely critical. Check the patient's understanding of what they're doing and why they're doing it. Check their motivation. Check they're not smoking still. Try and adjust other things. So, for example, many people think their asthma is out of control because they're short of breath. And they may well be short of breath on exertion. However. They may also be completely deconditioned, and it would be normal for somebody who is deconditioned to be short of breath. If they're obese, that's going to have impact upon their asthma control. And we see in study after study after study that people whose asthma is controlled, the heavier they are, the less likely they are to have to gain control over their asthma. So what I'm saying is look at other things in their life and their lifestyle which may be contributing to their symptomatology as opposed to their asthma. Now, we know that for the vast majority of people, taking more than 800 micrograms of budesonide or beclomethazone or 500 micrograms of fluticasone doesn't generally cause any great improvement in their symptoms because you're reaching the top of the dose response curve. So escalating patients up to 1,600 micrograms or 2,000 micrograms or 1,000 micrograms of, of, of fluticasone a day probably isn't in the patient's best interests. You've done everything that you need to do in terms of checking their smoking, their inhaler technique, their adherence to medication, their coexisting factors like rhinitis and controlling those. You've done everything you can do after a series of reviews and you can't get the patient under control. Well, then maybe that's the time to send somebody off to see a, a specialist for further evaluation. They've got all sorts of gizmos and gadgets that we haven't got and can take a, an expert view of what's going on rather than the relatively amateur view that we might have in primary care. Switching gears, what are your concerns about the new COVID variants and what's happening over in the UK? We see a lot more high levels of testing and people um, getting this variance that has now reared its ugly head. 
Well, the numbers have certainly gone up in the UK, as they have done in many other European countries. So today, it's uh, I'm just looking at the app here, is reckoned there are four and a half million active cases today by the Zoe Health uh, Study app, which is quite a large number, as you can imagine. However, in the last week, hospitalizations for COVID is falling. So most people that I know now have had COVID at least once, if not more than once. And the vast majority of people who have been vaccinated or have had a previous attack of COVID, it's a relatively minor inconvenience. People are generally speaking, feeling unwell for a day or two and then feeling fine. And then, you know, after five or six days, more or less getting on with their lives, which I think is probably the right thing to do. However, there are people, I believe, who are taking great risks in not having their vaccinations. And of course, there's 101 reasons behind that. There's a massive anti-vax lobby. And this is built around beliefs. And unlike asthma, where you can change some of those beliefs, the people who believe that the vaccines are poisonous and are putting microbots into your bloodstream and tracking you from space and trying to alter those beliefs with rational conversation is very, very difficult. It's not until they get a severe infection that they start thinking, I wish I'd had that vaccine after all. Most of the people who are going into hospital in the United Kingdom currently remain those people who have been unvaccinated or who are otherwise at high risk. There are, of course, some people who have been vaccinated and who, who end up going into hospital, but it may be that they are the immunocompromised people who have escaped the beneficial effects of the vaccine. We know that the new viruses appear to escape some of the antibodies created by the vaccines, but the impact that's having on us at the moment is really very, very small, and please God, it just stays that way. Well, Dermot, this has been very fascinating, a good insight on what's happening over in the UK uh, with diagnosis of asthma and how primary care works in, in the UK. Is there anything else you'd like to add to or say to our audience? I'd really like people to listen carefully to what I said about demonstrating airway variability or airway reversibility. I don't think we should be doing challenge tests in primary care. We probably haven't got the expertise, although there are safe challenge tests which can be done in primary care, such as the mannitol challenge test. But that's very time consuming. And in the context of the vast majority of primary care clinicians in the world is not particularly helpful. However, serial peak flow readings can be very, very helpful in finding out what's going on, particularly if somebody's having night symptoms or occupational, you, you suspect an occupational reason. So asking people to do their peak flows at night if they're woken up with coughing or wheezing can be very, very revealing. People with occupational asthma will have a relief of their symptoms if they're not going into work for holidays, for example, or often just a release of symptoms over the weekends or over a bank holiday weekend where they're no longer exposed to the allergen that's causing their problem. But reversibility and variability are the key factors which I would urge people to look for when making the diagnosis of asthma. Once you've got that, you can fairly well confirm it and probably won't need to, to doubt the diagnosis. But again, even a diagnosis of asthma is not 100 percent. We've all made mistakes, including my colleagues in secondary care because of a variety of reasons particularly things which are very unusual uh, and so you need to be not to worry about yourself making those mistakes as long as you've demonstrated that you've done everything you possibly can do in order to try and ensure that those mistakes aren't made or that the diagnosis is correct well dermot this has been great good information and different perspective from what you guys are uh, dealing with over there in the UK, and I really appreciate you being on our program today. Well, thank you very much for asking me. Uh, I hope that your listeners find it helpful. Uh, and if you're in primary care, you can look at the International Primary Care Respiratory Group website. Uh, and if you are interested in real life evidence, then the Respiratory Effectiveness Group website is perhaps somewhere you would like to look at as well. Great. Well, thank you again. Thank you very much. You've reached the end of another episode of Exhale with Vitalograph. Don't forget to follow us for upcoming new episodes, and please recommend this podcast to friends and family. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to you joining us again on Exhale with Vitalograph.